Bangalore, Indian Association of Cardiothoracic Surgeons, Indian College of Anesthesiologists, and the Bangalore chapter of ISCCM, I would like to invite you for the Sunday breakfast session on echocardiography. Before we actually start the session, I would like to request you to keep the mics muted all the time, excepting those of the moderator and the speaker, all the mics must be kept off and the videos off, excepting those of the moderator and the speaker. At the end of the session, you can either use the chat box function or you can unmute yourself to make your comments or post your questions. And today we have two prominent um, uh, experts in the field of cardiac surgery and cardiac anesthesia with us. Dr. Vineet Mahajan is a cardiac surgeon, very talented person. And we have Dr. Rupa Sridhar from Chitra Institute again accomplished cardiac anesthesiologist with us to lead us through the subject of prosthetic valves. And I request Dr. Vineet Mahajan to take over and do the session. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam, we are very lucky that to hear you today. Madam Rupa is professor and head of the anesthesia of Shri Chitra at uh, Trivendram. And we are all waiting for your talk. So we think without wasting much time, madam, you can start the talk. We are all hearing you. Thank you very much. Yeah, please start, madam. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be speaking to, with you today. My name is Rupa and I thank Dr. Murlida for inviting me to this teaching and learning discussion on intraoperative transesophageal echo assessment of prosthetic valves. If you encounter any technical difficulties, such as not being able to hear the presentation or see the slides, please unmute yourself and let me know. Can you see my slide now? Yes, sure, madam. If everything is clear, please carry on, madam. My objective is to deal with types of prosthetic valves, the principles of evaluation of prosthetic valve, pre-bypass evaluation of deceased native valve or dysfunctional prosthetic valve, post-bypass evaluation of prosthetic valve, and the role of trans valve. Same medical bilef valve has two semicircular hinged leaves. Chitra valve and jock shyly metronic valves have an eccentrically hinged single tilting disc in a circular opening and two orifices. The star Edward Ballin cage valve has a circular swing ring with two U-shaped arches containing a silastic ball. Though it is no longer used, we may encounter patients having this valve in situ. Now we come to the bioprosthetic valves. Carpentier Edwards has both the porcine bioprosthetic stented mitral valve and the bovine pericardial prosthetic stented Stented valve. You can see the pictures of both of them. Then there is the stentless valve. You can see it down. The, the Edwards Prime plus stentless porcine bioprosthetic aortic valve in literal dehyde. In the middle, in the lower part, this cryo valve is an allograft. Allograft is a transplant. Allograft is a transplant with genetically different individuals of the same species. Now, this particular one is the pulmonary human heart valve. This uh, cryo valve is an allograft and it is usually used in the aortic position type with the implant side. That is an aortic allograft we use to replace a dysfunctional pulmonary valve. The last one that you see here is a bioprosthetic valve affix, that means sewn into a balloon expandable or self-expandable stent. 
the bioprosthetic valves are delivered through catheters using trans arterial or trans apical approaches and they are implanted in the diseased aortic valve uh, we will briefly discuss the principles of evaluation of a prosthetic valve so we will be discussing about the effective orifice area index the dvi the patient prosthetic mismatch continuity equation we will see what is pressure recovery axillary time and we will always remember that post bypass hemodilution inotropes and increased cardiac output influence or measurements now how to measure the aortic valve processes it is measured transgastric long axis view you can see in this a a part the stroke volume 75 ml in this case is derived from the stroke volume is derived from lvot cross sectional area not shown in this figure you can see it in the next slide and from the lvot vti so in the stroke volume first in this case it is 21.8 cm the aortic valve vti is this in this figure b the aortic valve vti is measured with continuous wave doppler in this case in this picture it is 34.6 cm the effective orifice area of the prosthetic valve is calculated as stroke volume divided by aortic valve vti and it it needs to be indexed with the body surface area how to the aortic valve stroke volume is in the lvot c projected in the zoom mode is five aortic valve annulus L, uh, measurement of lvot velocity time integral is she is c cross the lvot is measured in the deep transgastric long axis view or transgastric long axis view the doppler integration interrogation b is maintained as parallel as possible to the lvot you can note the aortic valve click closing click white arrow here the sample volume is placed at the same location where the diameter is measured the lvot stroke volume is obtained by multiplying the cro cross sectional area with the vti we measure real time 3d transesophageal how can we classify the area of the prosthetic valve using continuity equation first divide the velocity time integral of blood flow across lvo by velocity time integral of blood flow across multiply this value multiply this value with the cross sectional area of lvot this slide shows continuous wave doppler integration of the bileaflet mitral valve processes in the mid esophageal view note that the doppler brief integrates the peripheral major orifice look at this it integrates the peripheral major orifice of the processes the effective orifice area can be calculated using the continuity equation effective orifice area is equal to cross sectional area of the lvot into velocity time integral of lvot divided by velocity time integral transvalvular the doppler velocities and gradients across the aortic valve processes remain flow dependent at high flows the gradients will be dvi and effective orifice area should be used to know the cause of the high gradients here you can see that the doppler velocity 
uh, index DVI is measured in deep transgastric long axis view using the double envelope method, which the two envelopes are formed by LVOT. The inner dense one is formed by the LVOT and the outer one is formed by the aortic valve. The DVI is calculated either as a velocity ratio of peak LVOT velocity divided by peak velocity of aortic valve processes, in this case 0.29, or as LVOT VTI divided by aortic VTI, 0.295 in this picture. So there are two ways of calculating DVI of the aortic valve processes, either LVOT velocity divided by peak velocity of aortic valve processes, or LVOT VTI divided by aortic valve VTI. This, uh, this uh, slide shows the same thing. Aortic valve DVI is equal to Vmax LVOT divided by Vmax aortic valve or LVOT VTI divided by aortic valve VTI. In the case of mitral valve, it is different. Mitral valve DVI is equal to VTI mitral valve divided by VTI LVOT. So in the case of mitral valve, the VTI mitral valve has to be in the numerator. Unlike with aortic valve, where the VTI aortic valve is in the denominator. Now we come to patient processes mismatch. Patient processes mismatch is said to be present when a normally functioning processes generates higher than expected pressure gradients because of small effective orifice area in relation to the body size. It is commonly applicable to the aortic valve processes. Pro patient processes mismatch after aortic valve replacement is considered severe if the effective orifice area index is less than 0.65 centimeter square per meter square. Moderate if it is between 0.65 centimeters square per meter square and 0.85 centimeters square by meter square. And it is not significant if the effective orifice area index is more than 0.85 centimeters square per meter square. Patient processes mismatch is associated with increased operative mortality, regression of the LV mass and long-term survival. If aortic annulus is small, severe patient prosthetic mismatch may occur unless the aortic root is enlarged during surgery. Now this slide shows the double envelope of spectral Doppler integration across LVOT. That is the inner trace. Inner trace shows that of LVOT. And also the outer trace shows the, the BTI of the prosthetic aortic valve. Here we see it is in the deep transgastric long axis view. And this picture suggests presence of mild patient prosthetic mismatch. Desired effective orifice area to avoid patient prosthetic mismatch is calculated before surgery by multiplying the body surface area with 0.85 centimeter square. In this case, it is 1.4 centimeter square. The size and make of the prosthesis that would provide the desired value is selected based on published data by different valve manufacturers. Here we see a diagram representing the application of continuity equation. On the left side of the heart, you can see the blood flow at the mitral valve, blood flow at the mitral valve and the aortic valve. At the mitral valve and the aortic valve, which is stenosed and aorta, it is indicated by dark black arrows in this picture. This, is, this you can see on the left-hand side of this picture. On the right-hand side of the image, the VTI of flows through the mitral valve, the LVOT and the aortic valve is seen. Note that as the cross-sectional area reduces, the velocity time integral increases. Thus, the product of cross-sectional area and velocity time integral at the mitral valve in diastole, the left ventricular outflow tract in systole, and the aortic valve in systole remain equal. That is the continuity equation. Now we will see what is pressure recovery. 
despite the absence of any prosthetic valve stenosis, high flows or patient prosthetic mismatch, the pressure gradients can be elevated due to the phenomenon of pressure recovery. When blood flows through a narrow orifice, it, its potential energy is converted to kinetic energy, which results in reduction of pressure at the orifice. Distal to the narrow orifice, the kinetic energy is converted back into potential energy to some extent, which helps in recovering the lost pressure. The smaller central orifice in bileaflet valves may give rise to a high velocity jet that corresponds to a localized pressure drop in the narrow orifice. This is largely recovered once the central flow unites with the flows originating from the two lateral orifices. Continuous wave Doppler recording often includes this high velocity jet from the center, central area. This leads to overestimation of gradients and thus underestimation of effective orifice area compared with invasive hemodynamic standards, particularly in small processes and with high flow states. Differentiation of the central from lateral orifice by Doppler is usually not feasible with trans thoracic echo, but is possible with trans esophageal echo in a prosthetic mitral valve. That is why when we measure the gradients, you, you have to keep the sample volume at the lateral orifice and not at the central orifice. This figure reveals a measurement of acceleration time, which is the time from the onset of flow to the maximum velocity in the prosthesis. In this figure, it is 55 milliseconds. The Doppler velocities and gradients across the aortic valve prosthesis remain flow dependent. At high flows, the gradients will be high. So, Flow independent matter in parameters such as acceleration time, DVI, and effective orifice area should be used to know the cause of high gradients. So always measure this acceleration time, DVI, and effective orifice area in the post bypass period. During TE evaluation before cardiopulmonary bypass, Confirm the disease of the native valve and check whether other valves are involved. Assess the extent of annular calcification and estimate the annular diameter of the native valve. In aortic valve disease, a small annulus may dictate the type of valve to be implanted. Always evaluate the feasibility of valve repair because it is almost, almost always preferable to repair a valve rather than to replace it. During the du during the pre bypass period, confirm the indication for valve replacement. Look for calcification of the annulus, commissures, leaflets. Assess the LA size, LV function, and RV function. Look for associated lesions, including tricuspid stenosis and tricuspid regurgitation. If the patient has a dysfunctional valve in situ, check, the thro check for thrombus, vegetation, abscess, or fistulas. Measure the left ventricular outflow tract, aortic annulus, sinus of valsalva, ST junction, and ascending aorta. If you're planning to use a stentless prosthesis, it is very important to measure the diameter of the ST junction. Look for any subvalvular or supravalvular obstruction. See whether there is any ventricular septal hypertrophy. If there is aortic regurgitation, look for the mechanism of regurgitation. Is the annulus dilated? Is there a hole in the valve leaflet? When the patient has a previously replaced prosthetic valve, previously replaced prosthetic valve dysfunction, identify the prosthetic valve type detect and quantify the transvalvular or paravalvular regurgitation detect annular dehiscence vegetations associated with endocarditis look for thrombosis or panis formation on the aortic valve 
structural valvular degeneration or calcification and detect and quantify any valve stenosis. If it is a redo and the patient has a dysfunctional valve in situ, confirm the cause of dysfunction. Look for thrombus, calcification, panus, vegetations, paravalvular abscess, ten dehiscence. Is the opening of the occluder restricted? Is the occluder trapped in open or closed position? When you are looking for calcification, always use low gain. LVOT measurement is needed to calculate the stroke volume and cardiac output to detect a SAM and to estimate the severity of AR. Measuring aortic annulus is important for choosing the size of the prosthesis. Why should we measure the sinus of Valsalva? With aortic root dilatation, sinus of Valsalva will be unable to hold the blood during diastolic. Sinus of Valsalva may become aneurysmal or even rupture. Supraannular, that is subcoronary, implantation of the valve processes may obliterate the coronary ostium. ST junction should not be 10% higher than the stentless bioprocesses. This is in order to avoid, this is in, in, in to coronary, the ST junction should not be 10% higher than the stentless bioprocesses to prevent annular dilatation. Iotic root widening may be required during surgery for aortic valve processes implantation if ST junction is narrow. If the ST junction is smaller than 30 millimeter, pressure recovery occurs, which reduces the gradient between stenosis and aortic root. So we need to measure all this. The average diameter of LVOT as well as the aortic annulus is 19 millimeters. The average diameter of the sinus of Valsalva is 28 millimeters and the largest of the diameters in this area. The ST junction has an average diameter of 24 millimeters, which is the least of the diameters in this area. The ascending iota has an average diameter of 26 millimeters. These measurements need to be done during the pre-bypass TE evaluation for taking decision regarding the aortic valve processes. Now this video shows the end phase 3D view of mitral valve processes in which the leaflets are stuck. The leaflets are stuck due to thrombus formation. This clip has been taken after the second clip has been taken after the stuck valve has been replaced. You can also see that the valve leaflets are opening. During the intraoperative TE evaluation done immediately after valve replacement, verify that the prosthetic valve apparatus is stable and well, see well seated within the native valve annulus and that all the leaflets or occluders are moving normally. Look for any suture entrapment of the leaflets. Verify the presence and location of characteristic transvalvular washing regurgitation jets. Verify the absence of paravalvular or pathological regurgitation. Verify that no air remains in the cardiac chambers and there is no LVOT obstruction by prosthetic valve struts or retained subvalvular apparatus. Verify satisfactory hemodynamic function of the prosthetic valve by measuring transvalvular pressure gradients, Doppler velocity index, and effective orifice area. So pressure gradients, DVI, and effective orifice area must be measured. The post-CPB period is often associated with a high flow state resulting in increased pressure gradients across the processes, especially at the aortic valve processes. Decreased blood velocity from hemodilution or increased cardiac output from for, because of inotropic support immediately in the post-bypass period after prosthetic valve implantation may lead to overestimation of prosthetic valve gradients and we need to, we need to remember this. The post-CPB evaluation of a prosthetic valve, similar principles are used for the evaluation of prosthetic valve in aortic, in the, uh, in the aortic mitral tricuspid and pulmonary position. 
using 2D echo, assess the occluder motion and stent mo motion. For any, look for any dehiscence. Confirm that the seating is stable and there is no trap sutures or tissue tags. We need to remember that the imaging of the aortic valve in the mid esophageal view is inadequate. So for the aortic valve, we, we should always use the uh, we should always use the deep position, transgastric positions. Using uh, uh, this is post CPB evaluation, post CPB evaluation of the prosthetic valve that I have already said. Using color Doppler, look for any regurgitation, closer regurgitation, which is normal, and also for washing jets. Look for paravalvular regurgitation, which is pathological. Transvalvular regurgitation is again pathological. You look for any pathological transvalvular regurgitation. Assess whether transvalvular flow is normal, increased, or decreased. Now, how will you distinguish between washing jet and Paravel, uh, and paravalvular leaks. How will you distinguish? Washing jets, the washing jets will remain inside the swing ring and are of short duration. The washing jets have a characteristic appearance depending on the particular prosthesis. Whereas the paravalvular leaks are situated outside the swing ring and are of longer duration. They are eccentric and they may also show flow de deceleration. So you can distinguish between washing jets and paravalvular regurgitation. Now this, this video shows the para, paravalvular leak after mitral valve replacement. Now we come to the spectral Doppler assessment. The shape of the velocity time integral across the processes should be noted. Peak and mean gradient should be measured. It must be remembered that these are affected by cardiac output and heart rate. The smaller the valve, the higher the gradients. The effective orifice area of the prosthetic valve, DVI and accelerated time should be calculated. There is a large body of data about normal ranges for peak and mean gradients across prosthetic valve. And uh, correct interpretation of echo parameters of prosthetic valves cannot be achieved without reference to a set of normal values which should be readily available in, e, in any echocardiography practice meeting. AC guidelines for prosthetic valve measurements are given in just 2009. This shows a contour of the jet velocity to the, through the prosthetic valve. Normal, that is early peak, normal. Triangular early peaking, uh, possible stenosis that is triangular to intermediate, significant stenosis that is rounded symmetrical contour. This is through the prosthetic aortic valve. So in the prosthetic aortic valve, rounded, rounded and symmetrical contour shows significant stenosis. Here in the last picture, this is the picture you see for you see in the subvalvular pulmonary stenosis. This step for comparison. So we need to measure the peak velocity and the mean gradient. Mean gradient is the is the area under the velocity time integral. Here you can see the Saint Jude prosthesis in mitral position. This prosthesis opens at eighty degrees and closes at twenty five degrees. This we should know. We should know. At which we should know the valves that are used in our center. So the valves that are used in our center, at what angle do they open and what angle do they close that we should know. Then only we will know whether it is opening and closing properly. Now this video shows some mitral processes with paravalvular leak. Small leaks may disappear after protomy. Here you can see the surgeon's view through the LA. You can also see the LV view. You can see in the first picture, in the 2D picture, 
there is a stuck left leaflet. And this is due to a tissue tag. Here you can see a tissue tag at one o'clock position to four o'clock position. One o'clock to four o'clock position, there is a tissue tag. That is why uh, the, the, the one of the valve leaflet is stuck. This shows a St. Jude in anterior posterior lie. Anterior posterior lie, that is in anatomical position. St. Jude in anatomy. Both the hinge points lie in the 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock position. Notice the hinge points lie in the 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock position. Blood will flow from the LA to LV equally through both the major apertures. In this case, it will flow equally through the both the major apertures. Here, uh, the figure below. In the figure below, you can see the same jute anterior posterior lie in anti anatomical position. Here, in here, you can see that the both the hinge points lie not in the 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock position, but it lies in the 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock position. In this case, the blood will flow from LA to LV preferentially through both the posterior apertures. Here it will flow through both the posterior apertures. This is the chitra valve. Here also there can be it can be placed anatomically or anti-anatomically. Here you can see in the first picture it is placed in the anatomical position. So here please notice that this is a long axis view. You can see the iota here, and this is a long axis view. And notice how the leaflet is opening. Leaflet is opening away from the iota. There's a long axis view, and you can see the leaflet opening away from the iota, mediocephagal long axis view. So when the leaflet is opening away from the iota, then we call it that the surgeon has placed it in the anatomical position. Now, if it is placed in the anti-anatomy, no, the second picture, this is a five chamber view. In the five the surgeon has placed the valve in the anti-anatomical position. In the Chitra valve, we should know that the leaflets open at 55 to 75 degrees. Here you can see there's a St. Jude in the open position. There's a color, the St. Jude processes, it's a color jet. You can see the St. Jude processes in the open position. It has three orifices. Uh, in the second picture, it shows a St. Jude in the closed position. Look for signature washing jets direction of the color jet. In the long axis view, in the same jute, they converge. In the short axis view, they diverge. <laughs> this is the perimount, uh, perimount valve. Okay, this is a, this is a, a bioprocessor, a perimount valve. And uh, the second picture, it shows the uh, 3D picture of a post of perimount and face view. This is the spectral Doppler evaluation. You can see uh, the peak velocity. <clears throat> you can see the peak velocity in this case is less how we measure and what pictures we get. Peak velocity in this case, you can see is less than 1.76 meters per second. Mean is a mitral position. This valve is placed in the mitral position. Mean, uh, mean gradient is six millimeters and the DVI, we have measured the DVI. DVI, as we told, as I told earlier, is VTI mitral valve processes by VTI LVOT. In the case of aortic valve, it is reverse. You have to put the VTI in the denominator. And effective office area, how 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 we how have we calculated? LVOT stroke volume divided by mitral valve VTI. In this case, it is 2.36 centimeters square per meter square. So after every valve replacement, one should measure the velocity, the pressure gradient, the DVI, and the effective office area. This is a must. Now we should know 
we are measuring all this, so we should know what constitutes mitral stenosis. So we, these values we should know. Peak velocity, if it is significant mitral stenosis, peak velocity will be more than or equal to 2.5 meters per second, mean gradient will be more than 10. VTI prosthetic valve by VTI LVOT, that is DVI. If, if there is significant stenosis, it will be more than 2.5. Effective orifice area in significant stenosis will be less than one normally. If it is normal, it should be more than or equal to two centimeters squares. And the pressure half time. When there is significant stenosis, pressure half time in milliseconds will be more than 200. Similarly, we have to know how uh, the evaluation of the prosthetic mitral regurgitation. This also, we should know the values. Uh, what should be the vena? If there is severe MR, vena contractor, how much it will be more than or equal to 0 0.6 centimeters. Then residual volume, residual fraction, and effective regurgitant orifice area in MR. What will be the normal values? We should know. And this color flow jet area in a severe MR will be large. And also, uh, other, uh, other parameters such as pulmonary venous flow. There will be systolic flow reversal when we look at the pulmonary venous flow using pulse wave Doppler. You can see the systolic flow reversal. So how to assess mitral stenosis? How to assess what are the Doppler parameters of mitral stenosis, mild moderate severe of MR, mitral regurgitation, mild moderate severe that we have to know. Now this is the St. Jude, St. Jude uh, processes, St. Jude, uh, pro, uh, Jude processes of St. Jude valve in the aortic position. St. Jude valve in the aortic position. The long axis view and the short axis view. <laughs> this is the 3D picture. See, see here, you can see the uh, regurgitation. Uh, you, can, you can see the, there is a leak over here, paravalvular leak. And look at the second picture. This is the advantage of 3D. Now look at the, uh, look at the leak. Look at the paravalvular leak. In this case, you can exactly tell the surgeon where the leak is. In between, you can see the stitches here. See, this is the um, anterior posterior lie of the valve. And then after that, between the second and third stitch, there is a leak. So if you are able to uh, tell uh, our um, job with the transesophageal echo is to help the surgeon. And here you can see where exactly is the leak between which stitch and which stitch that we should be able to tell. That is the advantage of using a 3D. <clears throat> this is the Chitra valve. You can see the 3D picture and the 2D picture. Now, this is a Star Edwards valve. We got a patient with Star Edwards valve in situ. It had remained there for more than 25 years and then it got stuck. So we got some pictures. It's a 2D picture. You can see how it is the ball in cage valve. This is a spectral Doppler evaluation of aortic valve processes. Here again, just like in the mitral processes, we have to measure the peak velocity, the mean gradient, the DVI. Look at the contour. Here you can see early peaking, the effective orifice area, and note the cardiac output. You. Slide is not moving. Yeah. Now, uh, regarding just as I said for mitral valve processes, for the aortic valve processes also, we have to know what constitutes aortic stenosis, mild, moderate, severe. Peak velocity more than 4 meters per second, mean gradient more than 40 millimeter mercury, DVI less than 0.25, effective orifice area less than 0.8, a rounded symmetrical jet contour, and acceleration time more than 100 is significant stenosis of the aortic valve. Now, if the If the DVI is less than point, if the DVI is less than 0.25 and the acceleration time is less than 100, 
if the, if the DVI is less than 0.25 and the acceleration time is more than 100, it suggests prosthetic valve aortic stenosis. I don't know why my slide is not moving. Yeah, evaluation of prosthetic aortic valve regurgitation. Here also one should know the uh, know how to evaluate using Doppler aortic regurgitation. You have to look at the uh, size of the jet width, the, uh, the density of the jet width, and also the Doppler parameters, quantitative parameters, such as regurgitant volume and regurgitant fraction. Having a problem with going to the next slide. Yeah. Now, this is quantifying aortic regurgitation using continuity, continuity equation. The LVOT area, you can see the LVOT area is measured in the long axis view. In this case, it is 4.15 centimeters. And also B, the B shows the LVOT stroke volume measurement. This is calculated as LVOT, LVOT area into LVOT VTI in deep transgastric long axis view. Now the C, the picture C down, the, it shows a mitral valve inflow VTI measured in mid-esophageal four chamber view which when multiplied by the mitral valve annular area gives you the mitral valve inflow volume. Now, how will we calculate the aortic valve regurgitant volume? Aortic valve regurgitant volume is equal to LVOT stroke volume minus the mitral valve inflow volume. In this case, you can see the LVOT stroke volume minus mitral valve inflow volume is 33. 8 ml. So that is the aortic valve regurgitant volume. How to calculate aortic valve regurgitant fraction? Aortic valve regurgitant volume divided by LVOT stroke volume gives you the aortic valve regurgitant fraction. Regarding diagnosis of prosthetic tricuspid stenosis, peak velocity more than uh, um, more than 1.7 meters per second, mean gradient more than or equal to 6 millimeters, and pressure half time of more than 230 milliseconds is considered as severe tricuspid stenosis. Now we have to look for collateral damage. Collateral damage as a consequence of um, uh, valve replacement, collateral damage can occur. And this should be, it is our duty to assess, look, to look for it using transesophageal echo. After aortic valve replacement, mitral regurgitation can occur because of misplaced suture through the AML. Uh, other things also can occur. Uh, coronary obstruction can occur manifested by right or left ventricular dysfunction. After mitral valve replacement, aortic regurgitation can occur. Left circumflex coronary artery injury or obstruction manifested by LV segmental wall motion abnormality can occur. After mitral valve replacement or aortic valve replacement, even VSD ASD has been reported. LVOT LV outflow tract obstruction can occur. LVOT obstruction can occur with septal hypertrophy and hypovolemia in the post aortic valve replacement for aortic stenosis, post bypass period after aortic valve replacement for aortic stenosis. Preservation of the mitral subvalvular apparatus and strut height may obstruct the LVOT post mitral valve replacement. So it is our duty to look for any collateral damage which can occur. Now we come to the role of a TEE uh, before deployment of transcatheter 
heart valves. Let us talk about this. Uh, measure the LVOT diameter. If small, valve undersizing may be required. Look for LVOT calcification. Small amount of calcification is desirable for valve anchoring. If there is excessive calcification at the LVOT, balloon dilatation may result in conduction block. Measure the distance from aortic valve annulus to the coronary artery. Right coronary artery may be assessed on 2D echo. Left coronary artery requires 3D echo. This distance, that is the distance from aortic valve annulus to the coronary artery must be more than 10 millimeter for deployment of 23 size valve and more than 11 millimeter for de deployment of 26 size valve. Another thing that we should measure is the aortic valve leaflet height. This is important because large leaflets may occlude the coronary ostia. Measure the basal septal thickness. If it is hypertrophic, there may be difficulty in deployment of device and paravalvular leak may occur. Look for large atheromas in the ascending or descending iota. Transapical approach may be required if these are present. Grade the mitral regurgitation. It may increase after transcatheter heart valve deployment. Now, role of transesophageal echo after deployment of transcatheter heart valve is to ensure that the site of deployment is correct, the occluder mechanism is working properly, and that there is no paravalvular leak or iatrogenic mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation. Measure the pressure gradient across a transcatheter heart valve. Here you can, this is the use of TE to look for cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade must be excluded. Now let us, let us summarize and conclude. Know the make and model of prosthetic valve used in your hospital and their characteristic 2D, 3D, and Doppler echo features. Perform and record a pre-bypass complete transesophageal echo examination. Watch and listen to the surgeon as they implant the prosthetic valve. Start transesophageal echo assessment of prosthetic valve before separation from cardiopulmonary bypass. I repeat, start before separation from cardiopulmonary bypass. Use transesophageal echo to assist de-airing of cardiac chambers. Examine the cardiac valves from transgastric views. So aortic valves need the transgastric views. Use 2D, 3D, zoom, and slow motion replay to examine the prosthetic valve. Use Doppler echo to quantify the hemodynamic performance of the prosthetic valve. Have available reference of the hemodynamic specifications for commonly used prosthetic valve models and sizes in your hospital. Sign, we are coming to the end of the presentation. Sign this at ETH Zurich. It's a public research university in Zurich, Switzerland. And the South African company Straight Access Technologies are using 3D printing to produce custom-made artificial heart valves from silicon. This brings us to the end of this presentation. Thank you for your attention. I hope you found this presentation useful. Thank you very much for a nice talk this Sunday morning. And uh, I want to add one thing in a patient with the uh, hypertrophic HOCM patients. Usually there is a mitral regurgitation and the mechanism of the mitral regurgitation is a SAM. And if the resection, if the myectomy is done properly, there is no need for any addressing to the mitral valve. But sometimes there is a organic abnormalities of the cardi and the leaflet prolapse in these type of patients and the replacement of the prosthetic valve or a bioprosthetic valve is required. In these cases, particularly echocardiographic <laughs> assessment is a little tough because of the residual hypertrophy in the mid and the apical region. So this is a little difficult substrate. We are a, a nice knowledge of echocardiography until the echocardiography is very expert in evaluating the gradients 
and knowing morphology this thing is not possible anyhow it was a very good presentation and there are few questions which were uh, arised uh, in between so this is one is there regarding the continuity equation and the importance of measuring the s3 junction measurements so madam if you like to elaborate uh, we will be very thankful to you what is the exact question so there is a question uh, can you repeat continuity equation once and another question is that please repeat the importance of measuring st junction mm, let me just go back to my slides who you photo se drive kar sakte someone wants to know the importance of measuring the st junction Yes, sir. As uh, Dr. Srupa is trying to get the slides uh, show, I would like to congratulate Dr. Srupa for that excellent presentation. I think each word she said uh, has some value and uh, it needs uh, attention. It was a whole thing has been condensed in about 45 minutes in a very very succinct manner she dealt with effective wall face area then dimensional uh, dimensionless index prosthetic mismatch continuity equation pressure recovery what is acceleration time and to how to evaluate the pre and post bypass and also she mentioned us about or told us about the um, issues we need to consider in transcatheter uh, deployment of valves and she ended with the recent advances about these patient specific valves can be used probably in the future so i think uh, that was a very good presentation as i said each word she said has a value she made it very condensed and uh, valuable uh, presentation uh, yeah. can uh, madam put one more slide uh, the one which shows ppm versus uh, a, a dysfunctional prosthetic valve where acceleration time and dvi are related she had one very beautiful slide can yes, she put yes, that yes. again for us i think she is she is trying to get the slide show on Okay. Uh, Rupa, are you there, Doctor yes. Rupa? Yes, I am here. Can you, can can you see please? the slide? Not it, not it. You will have to reshare the slides, and then uh, go through the questions which have been asked. One is about the ST junction. What is the importance of ST? Yeah, junction? I got the slide, but I'm yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, should I share again? One should I share screen part? again? Yes, please share the screen again if you want to. Otherwise, you can explain with your slide. No. With the slide, it will be even better. Yeah, I want to uh, screen sharing. Yeah, it got we got it now. You got it. Yeah, we got it now. Yeah. What is the importance yeah. of ST junction measurement? What is the need for us to measure the ST junction? That is the yeah, one yeah. of the priorities. Yeah, and this LVOT measurement is needed to calculate stroke volume and cardiac output to yes. detect SAM and to estimate the severity of aortic regurgitation. Uh, um, you mean you need that measurement? Measuring aortic annulus is important for choosing the size of the processes. Why should we measure the sinus of valsalva with aortic root dilatation? Sinus of valsalva will be unable to hold the blood during diastole. Sinus yes. of valsalva may become aneurysmal or even rupture. Supraannular implantation of valve processes. Supraannular means subcoronary. It may obliterate the coronary ostium. Now, ST junction should not be ten percent higher than the steen or stentless bioprocesses. ST junction should not be ten percent higher than the stentless bioprocesses. Uh, should not be more than ST junction. Uh, this is to prevent annular dilatation. ST junction should not be ten percent higher than the stentless bioprocesses in order to prevent annular dilatation. Aortic root widening may be required 
during surgery for aortic valve processes implantation if st junction is narrow in, in few cases in our institute have required this if st junction is smaller than 30 mm pressure recovery occurs which reduces the gradient between stenosis and aortic root the average diameter of lvot as well as the aortic annulus is 19 mm the average diameter of sinus of valva is 28 mm and the largest of the diameters in this area the st the st junction has an average diameter of 24 mm which is the least of the diameters in this area the ascending aorta has an average diameter of 26 mm now these measurements need to be done during the pre bypass transesophageal echo evaluation for taking decisions regarding aortic valve processes okay is it not correct to state state that the lvot and aortic annulus should be done during mid systole whereas yes. the sinus of valve cella sino tubular junction and proximal ascending aorta should be during diastole yes okay thank you and the other question was about continuity equation uh, somebody wanted you to re uh, repeat it not continuity equation i wanted Sorry. the slide which is post Uh, to distinguish PPI, PPM and prosthetic yes. valve dysfunction in relation yeah. to the uh, acceleration time. There was a flow chart. Slide. Yes, 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 yes. Before that, there is one question on continuity equation. If I am right, I'll just check on that now. Yeah, somebody wanted to repeat continuity equation. that is the the principles yeah can you repeat it uh, because uh, for clarity somebody wants to um wants you to repeat it yeah i can you see the slide yes yes yeah. we can see we can yeah so see uh, you can see on the left side of the image and the right side of the image on the left side you can see the flow through the mitral valve i don't know whether you can see my arrow But blood yes, flow sir. you can see at the mitral valve you can see at the lvot you can see at the aortic valve and you can see at the aorta this blood flow is indicated by by uh, black arrows dark black arrows on the right side of the image you can see the velocity time integral the vti this is the shapes these shapes show the velocity time integral of flow through the mitral valve the lvot and the aortic valve please note that as a cross sectional this is on the right side on the left side you can see the cross sectional area is decreasing isn't it mitral valve area is bigger than the lvot area and the aortic valve area is really small so you can see that as the cross sectional area reduces on the right side you can see the vti the vti is increasing so as the cross sectional area is decreasing the vti is increasing so the product of cross sectional area and the vti the vti at the mitral valve in diastole the lvot in systole and the aortic valve in systole remains equal the product of cross sectional area and the vti is equal at the mitral valve in diastole the lvot in systole and the aortic valve in systole this is the continuity equation as yes. the cross sectional area is less it becomes less and less the vti becomes more and more and so the product of cross sectional area and vti is equal there is one more very important question that when the paravalvular jet is considered to be significant to be addressed when the paravalvular jet is significant to be addressed and go back and you know tackle it 
sir that uh, we should when also when it is uh, one thing is if it is very small then uh, we have to uh, if it is a small it may disappear after protamine is it, this is the truth that uh, the paravalvular jet will disappear with the protamine no sir only only sir only if it is small only if it is small Okay, fine. Yeah, Agree. Can I, uh, can I answer, uh, Dr. Srinivas? Yes, yes, Srinivas, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah usually the paravalvulic in the mitral position is uh, considered mild if it is less than 10% of the circumference. 10 to 30 is moderate and more than 30 is considered severe. So, if those which are moderate to severe definitely must be addressed. Uh, less than 10%, we have a uh, way to think whether we should uh, go ahead with the, uh, uh, whether we should go ahead with the address or not. Now, in that case, uh, most of the time, if it is, uh, if you have a 3D, can you hear me? Sir? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, we can hear. Yeah. We can. yeah. If it is, uh, if we have a 3D echo, definitely we know what is the location and the exact circumference we can calculate. Otherwise, if we have a 2D echo, then we have to visualize the parallelic in multiple views. And then we have to assess the other uh, quantitative and qualitative parameters such as most of the parallel leaks after the prosthetic valve replacement are eccentric in uh, nature. So in that case, uh, we'll have to see uh, what is the density of this jet. If it is a strongly dense jet, if there is pulmonary valve uh, uh, velocity also, if it is uh, uh, depends upon whether it is normal or if the height is S wave height is reduced or it is reversed. If it is reversed or uh, if it is reduced, significantly reduce, again, it may be suggesting that there is severe MR. Uh, in that case, we may have to go back and replace the valve, or we have to go, I mean, go back and address the issue of uh, the, but basically this thing is the circumference. The guidelines mention the circumference, less than 10% is mild, probably we may uh, leave it, uh, but if it is more than 10% up uh, to 30 or more than 30%, definitely we should go back and address the issue. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Srinivas. Just a continuation of that is that uh, if the jet is mild, but you're given protamine, but the mild jet persists and there is hemolysis. So what do you do in such circumstances? The jet is small, but there is hemolysis. There is the hemolysis is persistent, persistent uh, yeah. after protamine. Yeah, in case of hemolysis, definitely we should go back and address the issue. At least in our institute, uh, we of late we have come across two cases in which yes. there was hemolysis uh, immediately after uh, 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 the surgery and the surgeon had to go back and address it. So nowadays, if there is uh, definitely, uh, again, one more thing is if it is a, a pan-systolic severe MR uh, yeah. with hemo hemolysis, definitely we should go back and address it. If it is severe, there is no question. You have to go back yeah. and address it. Yeah. But I'm talking about small jets. Yeah which persist after protamin, uh, uh, but there is hemolysis. That is the question. Whereas there is hemolysis, definitely we should go back and uh, right, address the issue. Do, we need to do you agree with that? No, sir. Protamin has no relationship with any paraprosthetic leak. Even a small paraprosthetic leak should be addressed because yes, they okay. tend to get increased over the period of time. Paraprosthetic leak of any variety, mild, moderate, severe, is not acceptable on the operation table. Yeah. Well, uh, our you. experience uh, in the aortic valve, uh, para, the prosthetic valve replacement of the aortic valve, uh, we have seen small suture jets uh, getting closed after the protamine administration over a few hours. So uh, oh. usually we don't are we are not very aggressive about uh, the very mild uh, paravalvular leaks. Usually, if it is moderate to severe, we address in our institute as our policy. The oh. guideline says that yeah. One of the uh, madams asked about that uh, dimensionless time index. Uh, what is that? Uh, uh, can you repeat that question, madam? I just want that slide to be re put, which shows yes, yes. no yes, chart, yes. post prosthetic DVI and PPM. And uh, yeah, probably that one. Thank you. Is this the one you wanted to say? Thank you. Is, it, is this the one you wanted to see? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I just wanted a picture. Uh, can you explain it, uh, Rupa, uh, once more, Dr. Rupa? Yeah. If the prosthetic jet velocity is greater than three meters per second, what do you do? Uh, so you, mean the, you look at the DVI. Look at the DVI. If the DVI yes. is less than 0.25, then you know there is a problem. 
and uh, that is a relatively severe problem. And then uh, if the acceleration time is more than 100, then it definitely uh, suggests uh, proxemic aldehyde stenosis. Yes. If we, uh, if, it's, uh, if the acceleration time is less than 100, then you may consider the value of the velocity. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Can I also contribute to this? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, basically, the flow across the uh, aortic valve uh, will decide about the velocity and the gradient, peak velocity and the mean gradient. So, in the perioperative period, especially uh, after coming off bypass, we find very high velocities and mean gradient sometimes. That may be related to the hemodilution and the use of inotropes. If you're using inotropes, yes. solar to inotropes, and if there is a hemodilution, it yes. will produce a lot of uh, uh, high velocity, more than three meters, and the mean gradient uh, may be more than 20. So in that case, it may be related to flow, high cardiac output, rather than the other parameters. So if you rule out the high cardiac output, uh, uh, one possibility is there may be some degree of jet, uh, the narrowing of the aortic valve because of three or four reasons, as already we have discussed. So one is uh, the prosthetic valve narrowing, other one is uh, or, uh, stenosis of the valve, or there can be PPM. So in that case, we have something called as a uh, less flow dependent parameters. They are not actually the flow independent, they are less flow dependent parameters. That means, uh, uh, so we have three or four parameters. One is the acceleration time. If it is more than 100 millisecond, definitely it suggests that there is some degree of valve stenosis or there is something called as AT upon ET ratio, that is acceleration time divided by the ET, that is ejection time. Again, if it is more than 40%, it suggests that there is valve stenosis. Second possibility is uh, uh, the uh, valve stenosis can be ruled out by what is called as a dimensionless index. Now, in case of aortic valve, in the same cardiac cycle uh, or during same systole, the blood traverses from LVUT into the aorta. So that is why if you measure the VTI, the ratio of the VTI across the LVOT to the aortic valve, that will tell us about the DVI. Uh, so it can be either a peak velocity or it can be a VTI ratio, either of these things. If it is less than 25%, it suggests that there is uh, definitely uh, a significant stenosis. 25 to 30% is equivocal. It may a uh, possible stenosis. More than 30% in the prosthetic valve usually rules out the presence of uh, possibility of stenosis. And then comes the PPM. So in a normally functioning valve, still the valve is functioning, the leaflet ocular motion is perfect, but still there is a very high gradient because of the PPM. So PPM is basically related to the body surface area, that is the effective orifice area. If the effective orifice area is less than 0.65 uh, per meter square, it suggests yeah. that there is severe valve stenosis, uh, severe possibility of PPM. Again, that relates to body uh, mass index, usually less than 30. The, all this is about less than 30 uh, BMI. If it is more than 30 BMI, latest guideline, 2016 European guideline mentioned that it is uh, 55. So uh, assuming that a patient is not very grossly obese, if uh, the uh, it is less than 0.65, it suggests severe PPM. 0.65 to 0.85 suggests possibility of moderate PPM while the uh, less than uh, more than 0.85 uh, centimeter square per meter square uh, rules out the uh, possibility of valve stenosis. So there are different uh, uh, causes which can be addressed uh, using the less flow dependent parameters. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Thank you for your points. <laughs> and I think the last question uh, is about anti-anatomical and anatomical. Uh, it was Rupa uh, followed by Vineet to reply to that. I think one Dr. Swarupa wants to know what is anatomical and anti-anatomic position. This anatomical yeah. and anti-anatomical position, it is different for bileaflet valve and tilting disc valve. Yes, yes. Now, uh, can you see my slide? Yes, we can. So you can see uh, in the first, first picture on the top, you yes. can see post-op St. Jude, the 3D and face view, anterior posterior line. Okay, you can see it anterior posterior line. You can see how it is. 
it, it, it is in the 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock position, you can see. Let's see the picture below. This is post of St. Jude in the commissural line. This is anti-anatomical. This is a uh, this is a three o'clock, nine o'clock position. So this is regarding by leafletting. Now let us let me show the chitra well. Next picture. In the case of chitra well, this, look at the picture on the right. That is the first picture. You this is a this is a mid-esophageal long axis view. Okay, you can see the iota. This is a mid-esophageal long axis view. And look at the leaflet opening. Please look at the leaflet opening. The leaflet is opening away from iota. Dr. Srinivas has to mute his mic. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, thank you. See, in this picture, in this mid-esophageal long axis view, you can see that the leaflet is opening away from the iota. You can yeah. see that the leaflet is opening away from the iota. This is called anatomical in the case of a tilting disc valve. Leaflet is opening away from the iota. Look at the second picture. The second picture is a, is a five chamber view. In the five chamber view, where is the iota? It is right in the center, isn't it? So in this view, second picture, see that the leaflet is opening towards the center, that is towards the iota. That is called anti-anatomical. So now why should the uh, uh, surgeon put in this, uh, put a, uh, rotate the valve here? Because sometimes he finds that the valve leaflet is getting stuck in the, in the uh, subvalvular apparatus. That is why he sometimes turns when he sees that the leaflet is not opening properly. So we call it anatomical when the leaflet is opening away from the iota that you see in the first picture where this view is a mid long axis view. In the second view, which is a five chamber view, the iota is in the center and you can see the leaflet opening towards the iota. So this is called anti-anatomical in the case of a, a tilting disc valve. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. And the final comment by Dr. Vineet, and we need to close after that because yeah. we have exceeded the time. Regarding, uh, yes. yes, sir. So regarding this uh, anatomical and anti-anatomical, I want to tell this yes. early, when the valves were there, we, they were non-rotatable valves. Okay. And once the valve is put in a aortic or a mitral position, it remains there throughout the life. Nowadays, we are getting the rotatable valves. And there is a procedure of sub -well preservation in mitral well conditions. So mm -hmm. at the end of the valve implantation, the surgeon, the rotatable thing is there so that he can fix the valve in a position, whether anatomical or anti-anatomical or anywhere, where there is a maximum opening and closing of the lifters. At the end of the day, you have to achieve that opening and closing of the position very well. And now we are having a carbomatic rotatable valve, which rotates with each and every beat of the heart. And it keeps on rotating like, you know, like a globe throughout the, throughout the you know, uh, coming 10, 15 beats. So this position, this uh, explanation is more theoretical than, than uh, really practical. At the end of the day, the valve should open and close very well at whatever position it is. And there will be minimum gradients and there will be no obstruction. Anyhow, it is a good talk, madam. Thank you very much, Dr. Murlidhar also. It was a very good, fruitful uh, breakfast of Sunday. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, we would have been sleeping and wasting time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> thank, you thank you. It's my duty to thank Dr. Rupa Sridhar and Dr. Vineet and all the participants uh, for the excellent uh, presentation. I really congratulate Dr. Rupa for that presentation. And we will see you again next um, Sunday, same time. And... Uh, Goodbye and enjoy your Sunday. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.